we have left. <laughs> and Terry, thanks for the wonderful comments from that side. Uh, actually, uh, this is very informal, and uh, Don and I were talking. We had lunch once uh, a couple of months ago, and have about three minutes on uh, this, and then we spent the rest of the lunch on another very important matter. Uh, something we're going through in the area here. But uh, anyway, uh, and we talked about eight seconds before this started and thought maybe we would approach this from the standpoint of trying to get through the 12 traditions first, and then uh, we'll take the 12 concepts uh, after that. But it's probably very important to uh, consider that uh, We'd like to we'd like to kind of hear from you a little bit about maybe what some of your concerns are with respect to the traditions and whatnot. So while you're thinking about uh, uh, maybe some specific areas or questions or things you'd like to see us cover uh, during this workshop, uh, I'd like to ask Don if he has comments, and I'm sure he does. <laughs> My name is Don. I'm an alcoholic, uh, and I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. My home group is simply known as the NAA group. The uh, law and form of the third tradition says that only two or more alcoholics gather for sobriety and they call themselves the NAA group. So that's what we call ourselves. We had a hell of a time getting central office to register us. <laughs> <laughs> I've been continuously sober since December 26th of 1967, and uh, I like that. Since one of the things that we need to know from you are some of the things I just mentioned. Who are you? What are you? How long have you been around? If you have some service experience, that helps. My service experience started in the penitentiary. We went through the 12 steps in five weeks. And in the sixth week, I was given a big book. I was given a big book and the next group of men to take through the, the steps in the six weeks. So the basic service of Alcoholics Anonymous is simply carrying the message of recovery through our own experience, so I got my first service experience right there. It was a year before I was allowed to chair a regular meeting. We weren't even allowed to go to the regular meeting for five weeks until we completed that school, and then you had to wait a year to chair the regular meeting because they let real people in from the outside. And uh, you weren't ready. So that was the next service thing I did. And I, I realized at the end of that little piece, because they were about to throw me, that the only way I could ever be loyal to that group is to never be an active member of it again. <laughs> yep. That's it. <laughs> the, uh, my service experience when I got out, I, I ended up, at that time we didn't have a corrections committee. I have a passion for corrections, I don't know why. <laughs> But I was just doing meetings at places where nobody else was doing them. Buena Vista and Canyon and all that. Uh, Don Burrow, who was in our area chair, asked me if I, he said, why don't you just become our corrections chair? We need one. You're doing it anyway. We can help you. You can help us. So that's where it started. Service is carrying the message. I learned what we would do that. And then you all went crazy and asked me to be area chair. And, uh, man, I'm telling you, nothing since then has bothered me. I'll probably share some of those experiences in my, my very first assembly as a chairperson. You're looking at one tough son of a bitch after that. We had Buddy Schreiber. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Paul, and, uh, anyway. And then I was privileged to serve as area 
Tim's delegate on panel 31, 1981-83, and trustee at large from 85 to 89. <coughs> Just ignore him. <laughs> Are you getting the sound? Okay. We're getting it. All right, that's what's important. <laughs> sure. I still serve. Uh, one of the ways I serve is through the people that I sponsor. An unfortunate thing has occurred in my life. For those of you who know that background, <clears throat> Because of all of the things that you've asked me to do, I'm not in a position where if I say it, there's a certain group of people who believe it's gospel. <laughs> and there's another group of people who say, if I say it, it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to be careful. <clears throat> but I've been away long enough that hardly anybody here even knows me and knows that do. Well, he brought me a message from an old friend. He just said, don't distort it. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the kind of things that I would like to know. I, I've come honestly without much of an agenda, and I know we're never without agendas in the human condition. But we're being asked to moderate and conduct a workshop over a weekend that has taken 32 years to get any understanding of it all. <coughs> And I do have some understanding of it. Part of what I will cover is not only service as it applies to AA, but the principles as they apply in my home. Traditions and concepts apply at home, too, and in my business. And Bill refers us to that. A far more dem important demonstration of our principles lies before us in our respective homes and occupations and affairs. So I'll be covering some of that. We need to know what you'd like covered. Because I happen to know a lot of the folks in this room know a hell of a lot more about them than I do. I don't want to get too technical this weekend. If you want to get technical, here it is. There's some really good essays written on the whole thing, far better than it. He was so good at understanding him, he sold it to a bunch of drunks who didn't want anything to do with it. Because <laughs> okay. it has a tendency to take personal power away from people. And uh, we don't like that. We just found some power. Why would we want to give it any of it up? So if you'll do that for us, it'll really help. Uh, just kind of what you'd really like covered, who you are, and why the hell you come to Estes Park on a weekend when you don't have to. I know why he's here, because she made him come. <laughs> In keeping with the tradition that's been established, uh, I need to tell you that I'm uh, sober since the 21st day of June, 1983, and uh, my home group is a Parker group Thursday night. Uh, we have uh, a meeting on Thursday night in Parker, Colorado. Come see us. Paul Jackson's still alive. It's in a way he refuses to die. <laughs> A, a year ago this weekend, he was dead in the bed in the hospital, and he miraculously came to. He said, where's the meeting? <laughs> I started in uh, general service work at uh, 30 Days of Sobriety. They hauled me to a, a district workshop. They had a panel on corrections. One of the guys on the, on the panel was drunk. <laughs> and there was an old barber out in the, in the crowd named Red. And... Uh, Anytime there was a problem, they'd ask Red what to do, and Red would tell them. And, and I just, they got around, and they, it was a participation workshop. Everybody talked. And they got to me, and I was just, I was green. And they said, uh, what do you think, kid? And I said, uh, I think Red ought to be on the panel to get that drunk guy off. <laughs> <laughs> They said, thanks for sharing. <laughs> a little later on, I was about uh, six months sober, I guess, uh, probably not quite, and one of the deacons in the group looked down the table and said, who's got gas in the car? And I said, excuse me, and he said, you'll do. <laughs> and he said, I'll do what? 
He said, you'll go to Casper, Wyoming to an assembly. Take a report and let them know that Whirling, Wyoming's alive and well. And I said, all right, I can do that. And they said, and take Mike. And I didn't like Mike. <laughs> Casper's 170 miles, and that's a long trip with somebody you don't like. <laughs> I took Mike. We went to the assembly. I came back, and they wouldn't let me give a report. And I had copious notes. <laughs> Later on, they, uh, they asked if I might like to be the district treasurer, and I said, I'm pretty good with money. I've stole a lot in my life, a lot of steel money. I said, well, we'd really appreciate it if you didn't, but if you feel obligated to, well, just make sure you pay it back. So I became the district treasurer, and then the alternate DCM fell down and got drunk and asked me if I'd like to be the alternate DCM, and I was just short of two years of sobriety, and I said, sure. Why not? And so I became the the district committee met a member a little later on. And uh, then I moved to Colorado in 1986. And I started all over again. I wanted to be the GSR of this group. And they said, no, we'd like you to be the secretary. <laughs> and so I thought, and I said, well, okay, I can take notes. So I took notes. And then the GSR got mad because they wouldn't let him vote at the, at the district meeting. <laughs> and so he quit in a big huff. The guy that was the alternate became the GSR, and the group refused to support his attendance at, a, at an area assembly after telling him they would. He gave them a bill, and then they said, well, we're not going to pay you. So he quit. And so I became the GSR of that group. And I, I kind of like being the secretary, if you don't mind. <laughs> and I was GSR of that group, and I attended assemblies. And the first assembly I attended was in Lamar, Colorado in 1986. Uh, in the, in the Colorado area, and that's when they elected uh, Bruce uh, as a delegate, and Bruce Ellenwood and uh, Frank was the, was the chairman. And I remember that assembly at that old community hall. It was 271 voting members at that assembly. It's the biggest assembly I believe they've ever had in the state of Colorado uh, in the history of the area. And since then, it's all been downhill, <laughs> you know, as far as, the, as far as the number of voting members. Uh, and it wasn't too long after that, and Mary Anderson was elected chair, and she asked me, she said, I think you'd make a fine state public information chairman. I said, I don't know anything about it. And she said, well, I think you'd make a fine public information chairman. How would you like it? And I said, okay. <laughs> and I remembered uh, as a GSR up in that little group, see, when you, when you sober up and you're, you're, a, you're a, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous in a little one meeting a week town, and that's where it was, you get to do everything. And I remember we ran the ads in the paper, and we had the little things out in the newspaper, and we had the, our meeting notices published in the newspaper, and all of this great stuff. And so I did know a little bit about it. I just kind of forgot it. And so I, I asked the then the PI chair, I said, what's going on? He said, nothing. And that was our rights of passage. <laughs> That's how the information got passed from one committee to the next. Nothing. Nothing. One word. Bye. Not even a goodbye. I don't. I never did see that guy after that. I don't know what happened to him. So I thought, well, I'll go see what's going on. So I started driving around the state. I went from Craig to Cortez and over to Lamar and Springfield, and up to Holyoke and back. It took a couple of weeks, and I found out there was all kinds of public information stuff going on. I didn't really have to do a lot. Just let these guys know over here what this bunch over here was doing seemed to be working pretty good. And I thought, this is a pretty good deal. So then I thought, I'll organize a committee. <laughs> and that's when I started having some real lessons about how drunks don't like doing stuff and about how they're real good at the volunteering side of things. And then when it comes to the showing up part, sometimes we're a little slip, slippy <laughs> and slow. And uh, so I stood for everything in Durango, Colorado, and at an election assembly, I stood for everything. And I was completely wiped out. It was, I batted zero. <laughs> and so I was sitting around my house one day thinking, I'm, I'm going to go down and see what kind of trouble I can stir up at the central office. <laughs> and uh, and I, Lynn and I had become good friends. You know. And I got a call from the new incoming chair, and he says, how would you like to be the state treatment facility chair? And I said, what happened to all these happy volunteers you said that? He said, well, nobody really wanted that one. <laughs> And I said, well, all right, I'll do that. Then I, uh, 
I found out a little bit about have a committee. It took me two committees. I'm not like Don. I couldn't do it in just one. I had to have two to really figure out how to be a good committee chair. And right at the end of it, the second year of that second committee, four years now, I'm slow, <laughs> I started getting it, how this thing really is. You know? I had lunch with my then service mentor, guy that's dead now, Don Cross. And, and Don asked me, he says, how would you like to, are you available to be a delegate? And I said, well, not really. I said, I, you know, I think I might make a pretty good area chairman. And I think I'm going to make myself available for that. I don't know about this delegate thing. I, I don't know. He says, well, I'd sure hate to see you miss it if it is your turn. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I got this book out, and it tells you right in here, what you got to do if you're thinking about it, okay? Now, so there's some instructions. It says things like talk it over with your wife. Might be a good idea. <laughs> Check with your employer if you're employed, you know, because you're going to be gone a little bit. They, they, they kind of cover it up with words. Okay, a little bit. You might have some things to do. <laughs> and I, uh, when, it, when they asked, I, I, my name went up on the board. And I was back BSing with Dave in the back, laughing, carrying on. And all of a sudden, I came out of the hat. It's not my fault. <laughs> I, and I, couldn't, I didn't even know what, what it was. I thought, what is this? This is alternate. He said, no, you're the dumb. And I was speechless. And I ain't been speechless much. <laughs> but I was speechless. I couldn't believe it. And I be, so I became a delegate panel 43, which is 1993 through 94. And I think probably a lot maybe changed in those 10 years between your panel of 12 years and, and the panel that I was on. And maybe four or five years from now, we can look back over 10 more years and say, well, probably a lot's changed, but maybe not a lot has. And I continue to surf. My group asked me the other day, this, this Parker, I call it my group, it's really not, it, it's the group I go to. Um, and it's the group I try to, try to serve at. Uh, but they, they were, one of them asked, well, why don't we have a GSR? They said, he goes to the assemblies all the time, why don't we ask him? And I said, no. I said, I don't think it's a good idea for this guy to be a GSR. And they said, well, why not? And I said, well, I've already been a GSR. And I left it at that. Most of them guys in that group don't know I'm a past delegate, and that's really good. They don't even know what a delegate is. <laughs> I'm, I, you know, and I was one, and I'm not sometimes really sure what the hell it is. But I kind of got an idea what it ain't. Uh, so my only qualification for being here is a couple of diseased members of Alcoholics Anonymous called me and asked me to come. I, I, I'm, I'm looking out in this crowd, and I know some people out here too. And I've and I got to tell you that the experience of sitting up here uh, with the Pope of Alcoholics Anonymous... <laughs> as his squire. Uh, is uh, pretty overwhelming. And, and, and it really in all in all candor and seriousness, I am I am humility is not my strong suit and being humbled is definitely not my strong suit. But I am humbled and honored to be able to, to uh, facilitate this or help in in this uh, regard. And I don't mean to, I, I kid old Don, he, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be black smoke coming out the window here pretty quick. You'll have like a new one. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so now that we've had uh, gotten some of the openers out of the way, uh, is there any, uh, is there any, uh, anybody got uh, anything they'd like? Share from the mic in a way of a question, or maybe some things that they'd like to see covered. Uh, uh, Don, did you want me to? Yeah, I've got to tell a story on Bruce Sutherland. He, met, he mentioned that Bruce had a knack of drawing people together, unifying. 
this is kind of what we're at. You know, this, this uni unifying of AA is important because we all come from different groups. And I've always had deep concern with anybody who thinks their group is the best because it automatically cuts everybody else out. We're all in the same game. Now, Bruce had a real knack for that. He came in from California. <clears throat> he came to DCM over in Glenwood at a time when one particular person was running the six groups that were over there. A despot. And they were going to have a district election. I'm not sure if it's the same one. It was just prior to his becoming delegate. But nobody was going to show up. And he knew that. So he went around to the groups that were there and he said to them, told them who he was, he said, I'm your district committee man, and on June 10th we're having a, an election. And your group can't vote. <laughs> you don't have a GSR. You don't have an elected representative, so you don't have a vote. There were 60 voting members in <laughs> formed groups to be absolutely certain that they were heard. That's all they were heard. Yeah. He was that kind of a guy. Maybe we Is it time for just a short break here? I'm seeing some of the smokers start to look funny. We've been at it 45 minutes. If, if you all will trust us along the way, I know we didn't give you any agenda at all, because life doesn't. And, and if we can stay spontaneous and alive to the thing, we'll get everything done we need to do. But you need to trust us a little bit that when, when it seems to be a good stopping place. We'll stop and take a little break. It's going to be up to you as to how many sessions, how long the breaks, all that really will be up to you and we'll do it time, moment by moment. Uh, but it seems to me this would be a good time to take, what, a 10 minute break? And back here around 825 and we'll move on forward. Good. I did a little bit here during the break and then, you know, uh, we got a lot of people here. We've heard the uh, from the front row anyway, and a few in the back uh, about maybe why you're here. Is anybody here for a reason other than something you've heard already? Like, you want to know who you, who you can kick out of AA? And <laughs> like that? If you are, go to the go to that center mic and, and so we can get some... Okay. Alright. Um, did you have one? Oh! <laughs> First tradition, uh, probably ought to read it, huh? We're going to use the long form, by the way. The short form has all kinds of interpretations. The long form is clear as a bell. This is from a service manual. It, it should read the same in every you got. But it says each AA member, or each member of Alcoholics Anonymous is but a small part of a great whole. A must continue to live or most of us will surely die. Hence our common welfare comes first. But individual welfare follows close afterward. You know, one of the things that, that I uh, talk about this business of uh, unity in Alcoholics Anonymous, there isn't anything more disunited than alcoholics. We all got an idea. And it's usually original. And it's better than anybody else's. And why, why, oh, why can't they see it my way? And uh, one of the things that you know we we hear maybe a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous now. I, it, I hadn't heard it when I was new, but uh, I sure hear it a lot lately. Is uh, it's about me, and it, it's my recovery, my program, my this, my that. And you know that's probably true for a lot of us when we're when we're new. We're pretty self-centered and selfish. It says that's the nature of our difficulty. Uh, so we we get into Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, and uh, you know it, it is about us, I suppose, at some level. But I think it's pretty important to realize that Bill uh, made a trip during the war, actually out and about the countryside to see what was going on with these groups. What's up? And everywhere he went, he kept seeing all this cat fighting going on. 
And uh, you know that it was the it was them old timers, and an old timer in those days had less than ten years, and uh, them new ones. And uh, you know they didn't know they didn't have uh, there was no group conscience, there was no uh, they didn't have elections. There was really there wasn't a general service structure as we know it today. Uh, the group conscience was whatever the old timers in the group wanted, and uh, they run the group that way. And uh, Bill could see that uh, you know that this business of getting dis disunified was going to be a real problem, and so he set out this principle in the form. It's actually it's a positive way to state a problem. And the problem is how are we going to stay together when our nature is to tear everything that we've ever loved, everything that we've ever known, everything that we've ever respected apart. That's our nature. Now, how are we going to live contrary to that nature? And so he set, set it up in this statement that basically says that without the AA group, without Alcoholics Anonymous United, there is very little chance for any one of us singly to get sober or stay there. And now, that's a, that, you could also turn that thing around in the form of a question. Is that true in your experience? Is that true? And if it isn't true, then what are we doing here? And I really believe that. I, you know, I, I, was, I was doing a talk here about a year ago, I guess it was. The thought occurred to me that uh, maybe we just put this up on the wall to kind of dress out the twin window shapes. <laughs> and then maybe the principle is just kind of a, one of them, well, that was for them 40s model alcoholics, and it's not any good for the 90s model alcoholics. <laughs> I don't necessarily believe that that's true. I think that certainly without Alcoholics Anonymous, and I have to always remember too that in my life I had an experience as a result of the 12 traditions a long time before I ever had an experience as a result of the steps. Why? Because I got into an AA group. That's where they 12 stepped me in to. And those, that group was a traditions practice and outfit. And they only had one purpose. And they only had one purpose. And uh, so uh, we might want to consider that, that you know, that, that statement as being true or false. I think if we can accept uh, that that statement is true, then it sure makes the business of swallowing this, uh, this principle of unity a lot better and easier. Yeah, the first tradition states the problem and the rest of them tell us how we're going to bring that about. The spiritual awakening that occurred for me, I'm going to put words on things that I couldn't have described when they happened, but I can today, was a unifying experience. I got together with me. I was now unified. I was no longer split into all kinds of different people. I was me. Wasn't much of me, but I was me. At the fifth step, I had an experience that I stopped being alone because in the midst of that fifth step with this other fellow listening, there was another fellow in the room. Up to that point, I'd been alone because it had been me and who I needed you to be. You didn't even exist. And in the midst of that, a spiritual event took place because I recognized there's somebody else here, and he and me, and I don't need him for anything, okay? All of those things led to my becoming a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. See, AA didn't get me sober. I was sober five and a half months before I ever got to my first meeting. So I can't claim AA got me sober. But AA, because of its nature, has made my sobriety count for something. Uh, and I'm one of those that believes that just plain sobriety, I just soon blow my head off. Forget it. I'm not interested. But meaningful sobriety I needed. Anyway, and it became apparent immediately <clears throat> that this was no longer about me forevermore. This is no longer about me. Because the very first thing they did when I awakened spiritually is give me other people and said, now it's your turn. Give it away. And that's been the, the basis of my life, and that's why I'm still here. <clears throat> as long as I can be useful, I can stay. So I knew, the, I knew, knew one group. 
There were about a hundred of us. Fifteen maybe made really meant business. Used to really piss me off. My sponsor said it doesn't matter what the rest of them do. What are you doing? Okay. Pure and simple. The group had all kinds of splits. This was a prison group, and the politicians would take over for a while, and the power struggles were going on. <coughs> and uh, one time the power people came in, and I lost a 12-step study school. That was my life. Every Saturday and every Sunday, I was reading the big book to people and working through the steps. And they took that away from me. And I discovered I, I must do something, so I learned to transcribe Braille in the interim. And then I got a real message because the guy that was in charge of the 12-step study school came to me and said, I don't know what the hell I'm doing up there, and it's getting out of hand. I need to keep the title, but will you go up and read the book? <laughs> sure. That's all I need. So I'm beginning to practice unity between myself and with you. <clears throat> They'd let people come in from the outside now and then, but I only knew one group. And then I came out and made the discovery there really are more than one group out here. And I must fit myself into every one of them. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I must fit wherever I go. And whether I feel like I belong in your group or not has nothing to do with whether you accept me or not. It has entirely to do with whether I accept you or not. That's how I belong. So, unity, unifying and unity begin to mean I honor the differences in styles. I don't condemn them. Thank God you've got a different style than I do. Wouldn't it be dull if we were all doing the same thing all the time? Uh, <clears throat> I'll make it short. I, I learn lessons over and over. Not that I don't learn them good the first time, but life keeps expanding and I have to learn a different aspect of it. Let's see, I was 20, <clears throat> 25 years sober, roughly. And circumstances I won't bore you with. I, I came down with hepatitis, got real sick, couldn't do anything. And in the middle of that, was asked by one of my messengers to move to North Carolina and go to work for him in the Department of Corrections. And I can't even tie my shoes at this point. But when your messengers come by, you go left family and home and group and all of my supports <coughs> and went down to a place where they don't even speak English they, they, they don't they speak southern <laughs> and I felt I'm safe my hero has got a group down there I'll join his group I'm safe and after my first meeting I discovered they just weren't doing it right and this was terrible to me. I'm, I'm looking for something that I'm used to, and they don't do that. It's a, it's a four-pronged meeting. They have a little meeting where everybody gathers first. And the very first thing that happened is this guy got up named the Chipmunk. <laughs> He's going to hand out chips to people. <laughs> that's fine. We don't do that, but that's fine. But he took this silver chip and he said, this is how you join AA. You want to join AA, you come down here and get this. And I'm thinking, my God, I'm in a Baptist altar call here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm 25 years sober. I'm cool. I don't make a ruckus. Then they have a meeting, a big book meeting, a meeting on steps 1 through 3, another one on 4 through 12, and a beginner's meeting. So I go to the meeting on 4 through 12, and they don't have a big book. They have a 12 and 12. And, and that's fine. It's just I haven't finished the big book yet. And they're not doing it right, and they made me nervous. And I, I went to all the little meetings, and I'm getting more and more agitated and more separated. I got finally got to a big book meeting, and we were reading from the family afterward. Got one paragraph read, and the uh, somebody mentioned dysfunctional family, and that took care of that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and then one night the little 19 year old chairperson of our group asked me if I would be the chipmunk oh. 
They also had a book raffle after the meeting. And I, I stopped being cool. I, I said, there's two things I will not do in this group. I will not be the chipmunk, and I will not participate in that damn book raffle. And knew immediately I had just made the biggest fool of myself I could possibly make. It hurt all the way home. So I did what I've been taught to do. I did some step work on it and some praying and got clear on what was going on with me. And I had to go back the next week and request the privilege of being the chip book. <laughs> <laughs> and apologize for being such a jerk. And you'll be pleased to know that that night nobody took chips. Nobody. <laughs> but instead of saying this is how you join AA, I had to say what I believe in. This will not keep you sober. But it's a very fine marker, a very fine reminder of the night you decided that's what you wanted to do. So come on down and let us help you celebrate that. And, and over the ensuing weeks, Many members of the group got up and said the same thing when they were the chipmunk. Many of them had wanted to say that. Many people can't talk unless somebody else does first. That's part of our leadership thing here, to encourage others to participate in, in the principles. Anyway, I also desperately need big book activity all the time. And... Uh, before long, they've allowed me to start a big book workshop an hour and a half before the meeting. Don't taint the meeting, but you can come in early. <laughs> <laughs> and we're doing that. And I quit bitching about the 12 and 12. Well, they'd read from the 12 and 12, and they'd share their experience with it. And since I didn't have any, I had to share my experience with the big book. But it was just my experience. I wasn't making judgments. And some people would say, where did you get that? And I've learned to say, would you really like me to show you? And then I'd show them, and pretty soon we got six, eight people, a little workshop, and I had become a member of the group. And I still don't like raffles, but the raffle happened after the meeting. It had nothing to do with the meeting. And I found a place to put myself there. I don't have to buy a ticket, but I was the only honest person in the place because I was the only one who didn't buy a ticket. So I started picking them and having some fun with it. And... What I'm trying to say is that it's necessary for me, for my well-being, and for my 12-step work the way I understand it, to be part of whatever's going on. Then well, God will show through me, he will show me how to create the fellowship I crave. But I must be part of whatever's going on. Because what's right for me is right for me. But it may not be right for you in terms of style. Uh, there are people who are going to come through that door in 50 years when we're all dead and gone. And I must be sure I have not changed what Alcoholics Anonymous is about because the fellowship itself is the greatest healing tool this planet has ever seen. That's what it is. I, I still believe recovery comes through the steps. But the fellowship is where we hold them together until they can hear something for God's sake until they can believe in something. Our words don't mean much. But Bruce stayed sober and walked the way he talked. And I've watched him. He's who he says he is, and he does what he says he'll do. And it's our example, and I need the fellowship for that, and I need your example too. So I have to help preserve that. And I too have some wonderful ideas on how this thing would be better. Uh, I will never discuss them with you, because uh, <laughs> it really would. But. <laughs> I also love bad meetings, now that I have a sense of unity. Bad meetings meaning those that don't agree with me, <laughs> or they talk about other things. Sometimes a bad meeting just makes me grateful as hell that I have a home group like I have. And sometimes that's all I need is to be really grateful. So and those are just some of the little things that have occurred around this. I belong to a worldwide fellowship, and I happen to have a home group. But I belong to a worldwide fellowship. I've been privileged to be in meetings in Russia, 
the Scandinavian countries, Puerto Rico, Guatemala, where the hell, Japan, it doesn't make any difference. I belong there. So, just a little piece. Nice piece. Okay, uh, you know, looking back at uh, in the 40s, when Bill was uh, making his little gallivanting around, there wasn't a whole lot of groups in a lot of places. Uh, most communities of any size, by this time, there might have been 1,000 AA groups, maybe. That's probably being optimistic. <clears throat> very few, very few communities had more than one group. They hadn't quite yet figured out the old adage, and I'm not sure how old it is, that all you need for a new group is a copy pot, <laughs> resentment, and so on and so forth. <laughs> I, uh, my experience was I sobered up in a one-group town. If you didn't like that group, sorry. <laughs> so when the group had trouble, you didn't, you couldn't just go down the street and screw up somebody else's group. <laughs> you had to go to the group meeting and look, sit there and listen to all this stuff and, and make an informed decision based on the evidence. And the evidence was usually tainted <laughs> by agendas. <clears throat> okay? And we had a lot of business meetings fighting about you know, we, we'd fight on, like, which wall the telephone was going to go on. <laughs> Worst fight I've ever been in in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> we want it on that wall, not that wall. <clears throat> this will not be convenient. And the price of it, it was a dime. They thought they ought to make a little money, make it 15 cents. Oh, my God, it was the end of the Republic. <laughs> well, you know, in the, in the early days, uh, this unity thing was important because if the only group in town blew up, there were going to be some people die. Now, here we are, and we live less, here we are, we're less than 100 miles from the Mecca of Alcoholics Anonymous in the Rocky Mountain. There were a thousand, a thousand meetings a week <coughs> held by units, some of which call themselves AA groups, and some of which are AA groups. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> So I wonder, you know, just kind of thinking in the gun smoke fashion, I wonder how important AA unity is. After all, you can just go down the street. Your group starts having a little trouble. Oh, well, I never did like that group. They don't agree with me. I'll go over here and sell these guys on it. And then when they don't agree, I'll go over here and go over here. I go over here, and five nights a week I'm here, 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 and here, and I don't belong nowhere. So I guess the question is, where do you fish and where do you cut bait? And uh, I think it happens to a lot of people. I see it happen a lot in the metro areas. I don't see it happen so much in the rural areas because they don't have no goddamn choice. And I'm one of the believers that if you give out these choices, we'll destroy something. So I kind of like the, the whole principle about, uh, uh, you know, hanging together and hanging separately. And uh, I know this thing has, has an application probably in, in other areas of my life. Uh, I'm married. I'm married to a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, you haven't lived until you've been in that situation. <laughs> And uh, some of you know my wife, and uh, she's going to be here tomorrow, so I'm going to get this out of the way. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> <laughs> the most important thing in our lives is not our lives, but it is the unity that is represented by that marriage. Now, I, I, I've got all kinds of stories about how to, how to blow up a good deal. I've been married four times to three different gals, had a half a dozen lighthouse keepers. I don't know jack shit about this kind of stuff. <laughs> but here's what I've discovered since I've been sober, and, and, and since we put our marriage on, on this business of, of unity as a footing. And the, the, the unity of that marriage is the absolute most important thing in our life with respect to our marriage. And that, you know, it's all real well and good that I have my idea and she has her idea and we have group conscience meeting. And there's lots of tie votes. I got a two-year-old daughter that's coming up through the ranks, and I'm coaching her. <laughs> One day we're going to swing the tide. 
I hope I have enough patience. You know, I might even change my mind between now and then. So, this principle, there are survival, probably not as individuals, but our survival for the benefit of that little girl that we made a conscious decision to have. And ours was not easy. It wasn't like the old days where you just went out and got drunk and got laid. Okay, we had to go through the big science route, so we got it done. And uh, uh, I don't want to romanticize it any, any more than it is, but by the, the simple token that we can live our life, our married life, using this principle. As the, uh, in the forefront of it. And that also brings it, in my mind, it brings it to the kind of a shape of a triangle. Me and her on either side of the, usually the fence. But at the top is this, is this higher power. And it's like an umbrella and it's like a shield and it kind of protects us from ourselves. And I've heard it said more than once that our traditions protect society from us. You know? And I'm telling you, I think our traditions can protect my wife and I from each other too you know, because we're our own worst enemies and when we get done being our own worst enemies we're our own each other's worst enemies so I thought I'd throw that in being if somebody wanted it in their whole life I'd like to talk a minute about some very practical applications of this the spiritual life is an on the street life it may be monkish for some people but for us it's really on the street my first street AA was with the old Denver Young People's Group. And for you young people, I'm sorry, but this is the best you can expect if you stay sober long enough. <laughs> it was our custom. It was just done. We sponsored a meeting on Tuesday night. And then we sponsored a meeting at York Street on Sunday night. One was our discussion and big book meeting, and the other was a speaker meeting. And that's where we sponsored them, group sponsor meetings. Okay. <clears throat> there was a meeting in Boulder. So on Wednesday night, as a group, we went to Boulder. And then Sunday night, Boulder would come down to our meeting. And then on Monday night, there's a meeting in Greeley. And as a group, we went to Greeley. And... It was just, that's just the way we did it. We went from group to group, not to change anything. We just can't be part of your group. And then you could come and be part of our group. So we got to know everybody in this state. We got to know that despite little differences in style and format, it's all the same deal. <clears throat> People come into our group that really aren't going to get well in our group. I'd say that, but it's true. And it's very important for me to know where to send them, where they might get some help. Uh, part of the folks I grew up with, we used to, to do that. I, I think they'd get more help here. We'd hand carry them out there to one of the other meetings, and stick with them until they got connected, and then go away. And then check a week or two later, how's he doing? And they'd call us, how's this one doing? It's really important to be able to do that. I, I can't save everybody. My ego would love to say I could. Haven't you had that experience where you've told somebody something for six weeks every day, you told them in the same words, and they come back to you at the end of six weeks and say, I heard the damnedest thing in a meeting today. <laughs> Changed my life. And it's the same words. <laughs> okay. Out of this little group of people, we had 14 or 15 real hardcore group and maybe 40 from the period of 66 to 72. Eddie died drunk in an alley. And there's two or three people we can't find. All of the rest of us are still sober and still very active in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that was one of the keys that we looked at. What did we do? We did things as a group. In addition to our regular meetings, we had home meetings in the home. Okay, Dogs and kids are part of this whole deal. How am I going to unify my home if I don't know how to make one? Okay. So we'd, we'd travel on particular nights in addition to our regular meetings. We'd have it in my house and then his house and then your house. 
We all got to see how we all each other lived and began to draw on that experience of how do you live sober. Uh, everybody remembers our house because we had an old dog named Spot. I mean, everybody's had a dog named Spot. Just big old ugly thing and just lay there while we had the meeting out in the middle of the floor. And then we'd stand up and hold hands and say the Lord's Prayer and the tail would start to thump. <laughs> Has that ever happened in your meeting? It doesn't happen in meetings. It only happens in groups. My kids got to trust me because they got to trust the people I hung out with. My kids didn't trust me when I got here. And they had good reason not to. Uh, That's all part of the unity. I must have unity in my home. I'm like Gary. We have a common purpose in our home. We are unified in our common purpose, my wife and I. We intend to grow old together. It doesn't have to be really esoteric. It's the only reason I married her. It is. I went back and th- being in love wasn't enough. I had to give serious thought to this. And that was what it finally boiled down to. I'm willing to grow old with her. And I'm doing it. We haven't had a fight for 23 years. Because our common purpose is so simple. She can whip me, and I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> Try it. We're dealing with life and death. We really, truly are. And on any given meeting, somebody's going to drop in there, and if they don't hear the right thing, they'll go away, and they may die. And so uh, one of the things they hear, uh, my home group, for instance, we meet at 6 in the morning in the basement of a correctional center. And then we all go have breakfast together. And that's where the real meeting hangs out. And we're all programmed for the regular meeting. I know what I'm going to say when it's my turn, and you know what you're going to say when it's your turn. But when we get down to bacon and eggs, then, then we start talking to each other. And that was part of the custom I grew up with. You go, go eat together. Go party together. Do things together. You got to. F- the thing that causes me difficulty that I must overcome to do that is I have to be at least partly interested in you, as well as me. And the spiritual awakening that I had left me with this certain and sure knowledge: I am you, and you are me. So unity becomes automatic. Okay. I think I've talked long enough. All right, we're moving on. Y'all have anything you want to add to this? You're experiencing it, by the way. I hate to point that out to you, but you're already experiencing it by sitting here. We are unified. When did you ever have this many alcoholics in the same room and not have any interruptions or fist fights? <laughs> There's something good going on here. <laughs> okay. For our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God who may express himself in our group conscience. <laughs> that one's shorter than the long, than the short one. <laughs> Well, now, how is this going to work, this loving God business? How is this going to be revealed through our group conscience? Is it going to come down, blow wind? Is it going to smote those old deacons with the sword of reason? (laughs) How's that going to happen? Is that going to happen? Well, in order, I think, for most of us have probably experienced it at one level or another. A group which uh, doesn't take inventory, doesn't have a, any kind of a sense of conscience, or doesn't have even a forum for those ideas to be expressed, probably is going to, going to suffer. And it'll be like the old groups in the 40s, where what the, the old timers ran the deal, and the new guys followed along, and they had the sniffing committees, and... and uh, Oh, you're a woman, you go in there with the auxiliary. 
And, uh, you know, Florence Rankin damn near died as a result of a deal like that, you know. And, and, and you gals ought to be grateful that she stuck up for it and told Abby to go stick it. <laughs> she was going to the meeting and she was drunk and an alky and she didn't get nothing from them gals baking sandwiches in the back. She wanted to be in there, and of course, then they had to have a meeting and decide whether or not they were going to let her in. And a couple of the wives were still going through a little jealous thing, you know, and they said no. And they said, well, she's going to come. And she came, and she got sober, and got sober long enough to got to get her story in the first edition, and then she died drunk in an alley in Washington, D.C. She didn't make it. But because of her efforts, and Gladys, and a few of the other ones, uh, maybe Marty Mann got in and, and eventually got and stayed sober. You know, because we, at least one of our co-founders, thought it was a bad idea to let you gals in. No kidding. And that's in there, too. You can read that. But uh, that came about as a result of the, what they later called a group conscience. But it didn't start out with the best information, I did. So... You know, when we're asking ourselves, well, you know, God will reveal himself through the group conscience, that's, that's all well and good, but how's that going to happen? And I've heard this, you know, God will provide stuff to the point where, you know, nothing happens. But it just sits on the hands. And God ain't got nothing to work with. So, you know, we've got to give him, afford him the opportunity and get the opportunity. I, uh, I'm like Don, I ended up as a result of a... My profession that I'm in, I ended up having to move down to Louisiana to an area of, of the world that there is no Alcoholics Anonymous. In that little area of the swamp, there was eight bars, 3,000 people, and no AA. And, and I mean no group. They didn't know what it was. No, nobody had ever had an AA group in that town. If you wanted to get to an AA group, you had to drive a little ways if you could get there. And uh, they might have BB. Everybody brought their slips in, got them signed, and they'd all hit them with a bunch of psycho babble, and that was called AA. And so I endeared myself to them. I'm not as patient as Don. I don't, I, I don't know how to go into a place when I hear nonsense. I, I just said, where's AA at? <laughs> and <laughs> I'm going to get diplomatic one day. Not, it wasn't that day. And, of course, I'm, I was immediately, I was a Yankee, number one. Yeah. And uh, number two, I was suspect. And, and this is AA, and who are you, and shut up, so on and so forth. And so I decided that this, this would be a good place to go trolling, but probably not a good place to endear myself to Alcoholics Anonymous. And so later on, and, and you know, we talk about this business of how does a group conscience get evolved. I went to this place. And I only know one way to live, and that is I've got to have an alcoholic in my life that I'm working with. And I don't know some days who's working with who, okay? I'm not, I'm not real clear on that to this day. All I know is I've got to have that cat coming over. We've got to get in the book. We've got to start seeing what it says in there. And I can read that thing to my own heart's content, my own head's content, but I'll start seeing it a different way than what the reality of it is. Turn me loose. So I got this guy. I'm taking a genuine active interest in him. Now, how did I get him? I got a 12-step call from a bartender. I think that's the best. So they, these people are on the front lines, you know, and they're professionals dealing with alcoholics. Right now, so now I went and did the chapter 7. is pretty clear. It tells us what to do when we go to these strange little communities, okay? And I think the advice holds true in 1999 as well as it does in 1939. Uh, we go and we, we, we contact the ministers, we can't want to go to the jails, we do this, we do that, so on and so forth. Well, I wasn't having any luck. They weren't sending anybody to me. So I thought, now I'm a lunch out guy. I like to eat lunch out. There's no place to eat lunch out except these road, road houses. That's what they are. They're hamburger joints and there's killing usually going on in there. <laughs> and they're knife and gun clubs and they're rough. And this is coon ass country, and, and those people talk funny. They talk, they talk French Southern. <laughs> How y'all are? Come here, boy, set yourself down, you know, that kind of crap. You got mis you, you got a syntax problem there. Shut up. <laughs> so I'm, I'm striking up acquaintance with bartenders. And I, you know, and I, and I tell them, you know, look, I'm, they, they say, you want something to drink? What's the matter with you? 
And I say, no, I'm a member of Alcoholics. Oh, my God! The temperance union. No, I said, no, no, I don't care what you sell. You know, I don't care what the price of it is. I ain't a temperance worker. I said, let me tell you something. I'll bet you there's somebody you really don't want their business. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we got some of them. And I said, well, if they give you any indication, any indication they're ready to stop or change or do something, Here's my card. Call me. And I got four 12-step calls out of those people. <laughs> now, I didn't have nobody to go with me, so I had to go single first day. All right? So, and, but I tell you what, now, they don't like it much when some outsider comes in to help them. All right? But one guy got sober. He got sober. And so I had somebody to take with me the next time. Okay? Now, that's how that little group got started. It started in my house. It was me and this guy. And then another guy, and another guy, and then pretty soon we had people coming in from Orange and different places around. They wanted to see what was going on. New group, new new deal, new swing, you know. And our group was, we started it out, and we started 8 o'clock on Wednesday night, and we went till everybody got done. And when you were done, then we were done. And then we went home. And then we went at it the next day, and we went out and tried to, tried to circulate ourselves out in the community. Well, this group conscience evolved that way. It didn't start out that way. It was just me and this guy. We had nothing but time. See? And I think that was that way in those... I don't think they had an hour time limit in 1939. <laughs> no. They went until the cows came home. They had nothing but time, those people did. we got to remember the times in which this thing was born. In the 30s, uh, you know, we were right coming off of Prohibition. It was illegal to take a drink in this country three or four years prior to the formation of Alcoholics Anonymous. They were dying by the millions as a result of bathtub gin and every other kind of nonsense going on. All right, probably.